great pleasure introducing uh, our panel today on uh, order journalism in flux, a matter of ethics or context. We have an exceptional panel. Um, starting from the right, Mac Handler, uh, who is the editor at large of Back News. <laughs> Jamie Welford, uh, curator, um, editor, also if you haven't caught the Liberia Remembering show that he curated for Photobill, please do, it's exceptional. Stephen Mays, of course, uh, curator, creative thinker, visual entrepreneur, as I've been told. Uh, welcome. Uh, Spencer Platt from uh, Katie Reportage, photographer. <laughs> Katie Images, did I help? Oh, sorry, Katie Images, not Katie Reportage, my fault. I am Nina Berman, photographer uh, from Newark. Professor at the uh, Columbia School of Journalism and also uh, has an exhibition photo bill on uh, fracking the Marcellus Shale, if you haven't seen that. And of course, uh, our moderator and host for uh, this talk, uh, Michael Shaw from uh, Bag News Notes. So, um, I'm not going to turn this back any longer. I'm going to pass on the mic to uh, Michael to get started. But uh, welcome again. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having us. And uh, thank you, you saved me the introductions. It's a very esteemed panel. I felt honored to be uh, in the presence of this, uh, this, this team. Uh, Bad News Notes is the only site dedicated 100% uh, to visual politics and the an analysis of news images. Uh, now 10 years old, our mission is to increase media literacy and visual literacy in an increasingly visual and visually persuasive culture. Um, we also are publishing uh, original photojournalism now, edited by Meg Handler, and uh, a number of the photographers that we're publishing are actually in the room, including John Lowenstein, uh, Nina Berman, uh, and then Alan Chin, Rita Leisner, Ruddy Roy, Stacey Kranis, James Delano Winslow, uh, so I hope you'll check out that section that we just started. Um, the, we're here though for uh, uh, Bag News Salon, which is a, um, a component of our site where we analyze uh, and edit uh, news images, uh, basically um, representing uh, key uh, news events of the day. Um, and what we're doing today is a little bit different uh, because we're taking on really a, a, a more issue-based conversation. Uh, and we're, what we're looking to do is talk about uh, some of the key themes um, and uh, issues and to some extent controversies that have run through um, the uh, 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 field of photojournalism the last um, year or two. But what we wanted to do is do it uh, perhaps in a more constructive way or to kind of get out in front where we're looking at images that um, uh, it re represent like maybe different themes and currents uh, that are facing um, photojournalism photo, photo um, currently. But uh, it's a young field, so I guess there's never been a time that photojournalism hasn't been in flux. But you know, today, uh, issues of framing, aesthetics, editing, sensationalism, uh, and then we have, on top of all that, the impact of um, social media uh, and all the changes in traditional media, um, which is really kind of roiling the, the playing field. So um, what the uh, format-wise, what we're going to do today um, is uh, I'm going to present six photos and then two um, short edits. Uh, and then um, one, one of those edits represents a series of photos that Spencer Platt took in Utica. And I don't think many people are very are familiar with both the, the, the really more like the, the events that transpired around that, that's, that edit. Uh, and then um, what I'm going to attempt, attempt to do also is show you um, a segment, a, um, pieces of a Time Lightbox uh, photo gallery, a photo of the week gallery. So um, we can actually talk about um, the, uh, the nature of the photo gallery because it's something that we're seeing all the time, but I don't really recall anyone really doing a, um, a discussion about that particular form. Um, and so I, we're, gonna, we're gonna do that also. Uh, I, and then we, our time's a little bit limited, but uh, I wanted to try and also see if we can't reserve the last 20 minutes to um, your uh, questions and comments also. Uh, so let's move right to the 
the first image. Um, this photo from the Boston Marathon was widely published on news sites, um, albeit behind graphic warnings. And what I want to do and, and start off with um, with Jamie is to ask, oh, well, actually, rather than ask the usual question, which is, how much gore is too much? I'm wondering why the Boston photos were so graphic. And then at the same time, uh, is that something that's naturally pejorative? You know, is it, is, is, it, was it actually a good thing, perhaps? Are we actually um, uh, able to handle more uh, of this kind of imagery? So, um, thoughts? Uh, my answer to that is, is the viewer has to, in a sense, make up their minds in terms of what they are willing to accept and what is palatable to them. But we as purveyors of story and news and image have at least to make available images of what has unfolded. In the case of Boston, it was an actually terrible, bloody event. And I, I did not actually see this picture. I've been out of the cycle of looking every single day at images. I mean, apart from when you said it to me. So I don't think it was all that widely published. I don't think a lot of people in this country may have seen this picture. There is obviously a trend now where people are turning away from the news. But I think one way to galvanize a conversation, certainly about something as horrific as a bombing, is to expose people to images like this. Uh, does that happen all the time? Often not, because in editorial rooms there tends to be um, a very, very limited appetite for showing and severe. Blood is often taboo, body parts taboo. But I do think it has to be engaged when, when, when the story warrants that. And in a case like this, where so many were injured and maimed, there is value in showing that to people. Um. Just to add another little twist on this, uh, you, people probably did see this version of it, and there was the, some controversy around it because uh, what the Daily News did, um, using this as uh, actually a double spread the, from the front page all the way to the sports section, uh, back page, was um, doctor uh, the photo so that if you look, I know we're challenged a little bit with the light, but if you look in the top, uh, left corner of the photo, the woman, uh, again, this picture is mostly shown in, I think, photo galleries where you did have to click through after a warning, but you'll see that her, um, her leg is uh, actually severed. And what the Daily News did was um, basically put the leg back together and then run this, uh, you know, it's a double page spread. So I, I guess in a way, I'm, I'm wondering if, and this is a question for all the panelists, uh, you know, are we in new territory now in terms of uh, graphic or violent imagery? And uh, in this case, you know, was the Daily News, you know, kind of swept up in that, you know, trying to almost like have it both ways, some priority, but also you know, something that's like ex extremely um, uh, salacious. What I found really interesting is that the picture itself is kind of about handling the violence. Right? So like, it's not one of these pictures of this sort of moment of drama, but that the woman is kind of handling it. And so maybe that allowed the news to publish it more easily. I don't know, but when I look at this picture, I feel like she's, even though maybe in shock, she's kind of okay. Right? The woman on the right. I'm, uh, I'm just amazed that you know, our, our society today, it has a, a seemingly uh, endless uh, thirst capacity for violence. It's, it's personally, I, I can't even really go to the movies anymore. I, I, I can watch it like, Downton Abbey. That's, that's about it. It's about as far as I go. And you know, like Grand Theft Auto, uh, and all this stuff. And, and then you know, you have this you know picture. And yeah, it's bloody, it's gory, but you know, there's there's outrage. There's people that are angry. These are the same people that are that are filing, you know, queuing up to go see the latest, you know, gore flick. And uh, so I, I've always had trouble. Sadly, the, the example you just point out is, is not unique by any means. And there was a case a few years ago with the Madrid train bombing, where there was a very widely published picture, uh, and in the foreground of the photograph was a severed hand, which in most publications was removed. Um, you know, so this thing happens. The one which I think you know, caused, you know, alerted me to all of this goes way back to 1991 or two, when Black Hawk Down in uh, Somalia, where there was a picture of a an American soldier who had been lynched and had been dragged behind a tank uh, and, and killed. 
horrible, bloody, brutal picture, full frame, shot by a photographer for the Toronto Star, and it published. And Time magazine, I remember very well, published it also full frame. And what they retouched with a man's shorts because his balls were hanging out. And what, 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 what ex I find so extraordinary, which I think really continues to this day, is it really alerted me to the notion of taste, censorship for taste. That the most shocking thing about that picture, which would be the man's genitalia, and not the violence that was expressed, really set a bell ringing in my mind. And I've been watching this now for, you know, since, well, 20 years. And this notion of censorship for public taste, I find obnoxious. Um, I find it utterly destructive. And of course, you have to realize we're working in a commercial context, so it's ultimately about money and you know, pacifying advertisers. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's very disturbing. I, I think that the, the audience is important also to consider here because people I think, at least in the United States, are not used to seeing such violence on the cover of their newspapers and magazines. Michael and I talked a lot about this in preparation of why the Boston Marathon bombing and the photographs from it were so graphic and so um, accessible to us. And it was almost as if the editors at certain publications were not maybe um, as fearful of putting a severed limb on the cover. Because as, as we said, the Daily News has it both ways here. They get the punch and the graphic, but they didn't want the severed limb. So there, I think there's a little bit more of an openness in an editor's mind to show this, partially because of what Spencer's saying, is that we're so bombarded with the violence in pop culture that now we can see it in the news easier. I, mean, I do want to say about the Daily News where I worked for five years editing, editing their archive. They prided themselves on images of violence, particularly in relationship to mafia in New York City. They had an exhaustive collection of torn up and bloody bodies lined everywhere. And they're also infamous for growing to be an incredibly powerful and muscular newspaper based on their photography, and specifically on a very famous image of Ruth Schneider being electrocuted in, I think, 1928 at Sing Sing Prison. And the headline simply read, dead. And it actually shows her being electrocuted. So they do have a history of actually being permissive that way. But very quickly to speak to one, Stephen was saying, I, I clearly remember in relationship to the testicle moment, I, I was looking and we, we developed and worked on a bombing in Tel Aviv for three or four days. The picture just showed the mangled remnants of a, of a terrorist attack that had taken out 15 people on a bus. And it was going to print until the editor called up and pulled it off. And the reason he pulled it is because they looked closely at the picture and saw that there was an exposed woman's breast. Apart from all the blood and the ravages of what had happened, that was the deciding issue for an editor who, well, to go back to the reference of balls, had none. <laughs> <laughs> if I may, I want to take a little bit away from the violence issue for a moment, which is you know, one of the things which struck me very much about the representation of the Boston situation is the, is the hysteria that was whipped up around it. And that you know, the imagery like this, and the, there, were, there were others, maybe less graphic, but there was a, there was a mystery, both in social media and in the conventional media. Um, which is, I also find extremely interesting. Three people died, which is shocking and terrible. 80 people a day die from gun violence in the USA. And this, this, this incident happened at the time when Congress was refusing to tackle the issues around uh, legislation for gun violence. But Boston was shut down for a week over three deaths. Uh, I, I just think it's extraordinary how, how the, the media uses violence in some ways as a distraction uh, from issues it doesn't want to engage in. Uh, let's switch gears to a, a very different uh, image. Uh, uh, first off, a show of hands, how many people have seen this picture? Okay. Uh, 
it'd be really fun to just go around the room and, and ask people what it, what it shows. Uh, it, let's see, to start off, uh, let me just read you the Reuters caption, uh, condensed a little bit. Gold medalist Team Russia kiss and celebrate at the women's 4x400 four meter relay victory ceremony during the World Athletic Championships in Moscow, uh, August 17, 2013. Um, let's see. Now, uh, this was familiar, the picture's familiar to news consumers because Western online news sites ran the photo everywhere for at least, you know, half a uh, news cycle um, with the headlines. The one um, that Salon, uh, it was Salon or Slate, it was Slate, Slate ran, um, ran a, this photo, or I think actually a close up of the, the two women, under the headlines Russian athletes kiss on winner's podium to protest anti gay law. <coughs> and the, um, the photo circulated about a week after um, President Putin signed the, the anti gay law. And I think also. Um, in that one or two week period, there was also starting to be some controversy about um, Sochi uh, and how the, um, and to what extent uh, athletes would be able to show any kind of imagery pro uh, uh, on their um, uh, on their uniforms uh, in protest of like their anti-gay policy. Uh, what's, what was really interesting, though, is that uh, and people di didn't uh, run corrections until a day later, and, and by then, you know, these things get associated the image to a particular context and then the next day it's kind of like water under the bridge. But uh, if you, uh, the, first of all, the two women were saying, we didn't have any political agenda. We act, in fact, we don't even know where this is coming from. We don't know if anybody's talking about here. We're both <coughs> happily married. We, you know, it's like, this is just bizarre. And so, then what's interesting, and I, in a way I intentionally didn't bring the video for you to, to see, because it's also um, instructive to know how like these images are so indelible once you get them in your head, even if you know what really happened, because if, when you look at the video of this, and it was not easy to find, uh, by the way, um, what you see are the women on the um, winner stand, and they've been awarded their medals, and they're, and, you know, they're, uh, and uh, they're waving, and then right at the second where they um, are all celebrated by the, the crowd, there was these like really quick kisses, these like little pecks that went like 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 that, all between, between all four of them. And, and what's interesting about the photo, I think, is that not just does it look like well, actually, you know what? I think I'm going to stop right there and, and ask the, the the panelists what they what what they the, the the caption, the original caption said. And I give credit to Reuters because I didn't get swept up into it. Um, gold medalist Team Russia kiss and celebrate at the women's 4x400 four meter relay victory ceremony during the World Athletic Championships in Moscow. I mean, I, personally, as, as a wire photographer, you're shooting, uh, you know, five, six days a week, uh, probably filing, I don't know, three, four, five hundred images a week to the wire. You know, I, I Google search my to see where, where, what's going where, and yeah, you know, your, your photos, once, once you, you throw them out the window, they're, they're in the big world, and they're always extremely, especially in today's media landscape, extremely vulnerable to misinterpretation, to, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sometimes shocked. I mean, I, I look at a photo, and it's just like, totally taken out of context, and it's, um, and, you know, looking you know, it's... Well, one question is, is this sort of like a, maybe this is a little bit extreme, is this sort of like a Judy Miller moment, in a way, you know, where, you know, it's, the, where the media gets caught up a little bit in the kind of, you know, U.S. versus Russia, and you know, there's a lot of power, the politics going back and forth, and then, then, then the narrative gets ascribed to the vote. What do you think? Well, I think that I, I think that the story was so prominent that week, and that we were seeing a lot of pictures from Moscow of people protesting with rainbow flags, and everything kind of looked the same. There wasn't anything that interesting to illustrate the stories with. So when an editor maybe saw this, they had this preconception, <clears throat> maybe the second they saw the photo, to say this is an illustration of people protesting for their rights. It, the caption didn't say that. So it, it's just some snap judgment, but then everybody runs with it. And then it becomes this iconic photo for the week. 
think of, wow, look at these two Russian athletes kissing. This, I mean, I don't want to go off on this European thing, but the women kissing women, men kissing men, it's a very social gesture. And in the United States, I think we just feel the need to sexualize it immediately. It, it is a hell of a kiss. It, it's pretty sexy. <laughs> it, it's the angle, though. <laughs> But I, just to, to follow what Spencer said, the, the original caption, did it suggest anything related to No, people? not at all. I, I know that the press was struggling to find images to represent gay love in Russia, because I got calls from people asking me if I knew anybody who had ever covered the story. And I'm not even in the business, really, anymore. So. But stretching things that way, I will, as an example, very quickly, it's a bit of an aside, but. The fall of Iraq, April 9th, 2003. On Wednesday, the city fell. A picture ran in the New York Times showing an Iraqi kissing an American soldier. By Thursday, Iraq was on fire. It was pandemonium in the streets. Anarchy had erupted. At the time, I was working in Newsweek, and they were forcing my hands for days to find a picture of an uh, Iraqi kissing an American soldier. They wanted the cover of the magazine to say victory. It didn't matter that it was burning and that people were looting and they were shooting. It was all about showing this love of the American invading and winning. And the per I did eventually find one. And I've never been forgiven by the photographer, ever. So we still laugh about it. But no one else I knew calling to find that picture really had it. But they wanted it, so no matter what the circumstances, that was going to be their cover, and it's still their cover. I should also say U.S. News ran that cover, and they just had to have it that way. And it was inaccurate. It's um, interesting to note that in 1968, uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their hands on the podium in Mexico. And uh, they said at the time that it was a, 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 national, a national salute. Uh, and they actually attempted to distance themselves from it being criticized as a black power salute. However, the point is that pictures mean what we want them to mean, and the picture serves its purpose extremely well. And whatever the women's intentions, I think they've served a very important cause extremely well. I think it was Susan Sontag in <coughs> Regarding the Pain of Others says that you know, a picture changes nothing. What changes something is us. When a picture is co-opted by an existing political movement or a social movement, then it gathers force. The picture in itself is, is what we want it to mean. And in this instance, I'm very happy that it was taken up and whether it was interpreted correctly or incorrectly, I think it was an important message that has, has gone around. Uh, all right, we're, we're going to open a big can. We're going to open a big can of worms now. There it is. <laughs> Uh, a, a minor but very, very important piece of information to have in mind before we talk about this cover is that, and, and a lot of you may know this already, but the photo uh, was, uh, ran on the front page of the New York Times on May 6th um, without that much foment, uh, and then it appeared again on the cover of Rolling Stone July 16th, so about two months and a week or so. Uh, and, and by the way, another really important point to make is that both um, uh, appearances of the image uh, ran with very long, very well told, uh, very, uh, I think it was widely considered objective stories, but it was more what happened in terms of just this cover the second time this uh, hit, hit the newsstands and the digital newsstands. Um, one, uh, just to give you the two sides of it, eloquently, I think, one Rolling Stone commenter said, the um, Instagram selfie of Zokart Tsarnaev on the cover makes the bomber look like the new Jim Morrison. And then uh, a critic I really like, pretty young guy, uh, Nathan Jurgensen, uh, on the other hand, wrote, the page one bomber selfie challenges what may, many of us thought the bomber would look like on the day that uh, the tragedy occurred. This. Uh, this image doesn't conform to what we, as a culture, wanted, perhaps even needed, the bomber to look like. Instead of the stereotypical guy in a cave or guy in a shack, 
Zokar here looks like someone we might know. More than that, given that this is an Instagram selfie, he even acts like someone we know, someone we recognize as normal. The bomber selfie forces us to confront that violence doesn't always come from an other. It is, e it is even cropped square. I can almost picture the now customary like or heart Facebook and Instagram buttons with this photo. As such, this front page acts a bit like a mirror. The Instagram filter forces us not to just see Zokar, but ourselves, our own modern culture too. As perhaps the most controversial photo that, uh, in the last six months, uh, my question for Stephen, just to start things off, is, uh, is irony dead? <laughs> No, it's, I, I, think it's, uh, I think everything that followed from the publication of this picture was somewhat tragic. Um, but it did smoke out this, this sort of cartoon relationship we have with information. That it's, it's got to be spelled out in these clear terms. And you know, information has to be handed to us in these carefully processed ways that um, you know, pre-digest the story for us. I think your example of the idea you know, the bank like this is a great example of that. Sadly, it happens many, many times a day. But uh, it's something which, you know, I was born shortly after the end of the Second World War, and something I've, I've, my mother is German, and I've thought very long and very hard about what these people look like. Who was it who executed those extraordinary atrocities? And my conclusion is that they look pretty much like me. And that's the point, that you know, evil in the world doesn't come from a specially bred collection of people with identifiable characteristics. Evil is amongst us, and we don't often know it until it, it, it hits. And I think that that's really the, the power of this picture, is that it makes us recognize that it is just like us. Yeah, I I, I think for, for me it's just simply that it, I, I, I appreciate the picture for what it is because I think any time a photo like this comes up it, it, it starts it, people talking, it starts controversy and we, we need, we have to have that, we always need uh, fresh air in, in, in photojournalism and, and just photography at large. But personally for me what's, what's just shocking about it is the context. It's, it's Rolling Stone, I, I know Rolling Stone uh, does some marketing journalism but I perceive growing up in Rolling Stone as I want to see Willie Nelson or Jay-Z on the cover, and that's what I expect. And if this photo had been on time, I don't think there'd be any controversy, but it's because of Rolling Stone, and you have Jay-Z's name next to it, and it's just, it plays with your mind. What is this? Is this a celebrity or is this a terrorist? I was really interested in the pushback um, against this picture. Um, there was, I think, one of the Boston police or emergency medical guys, yeah, okay. Okay. The next day, he released all of these pictures that he himself had taken of the arrest, I think. And so to show, look, this is who he really is, like this is how it really happened. But the pictures showed you nothing. I mean, they were absolutely the most sort of boring, uninformative pictures I've kind of seen. But yet there was this, it was passed around a lot as though, look, look, this is the true story of this person. I didn't really quite understand. Do you have a sense of you know, people were going to Walmart and saying you have to stop selling Rolling Stone? Yeah. So is it because it was equated with being a celebrity, like being a pop star, or just that he looks like this kind of, you know, sweet, somewhat sensual boy? Well, I, I just wanted to say everyone, maybe not everyone in the room remembers because I've seen my kids here. But the O.J. Simpson controversy on the cover there, where they actually doctored the image to present O.J. as a more menacing figure. Dark in the sky, highlights with red. So I guess that was an option they could have applied to <laughs> this guy. And I'm, thankfully, they did not. Thankfully, they left it as it is. I, I'm taken by it. Actually, it's, it is, right. it's credited as a photo. So they did, they did do put something. an artist on it, although I can't quite tell what they did. They did, they, they did illustrate this photo somehow. To make him look more beautiful, young, vulnerable? I don't know. Does yeah, anybody know? Me to see the Photoshop, but if anybody yeah. knows who the artist was, I don't know. Any, anyway, I, I wanted to kind of jump off what Nina said, because I think that I 
think that what really bothered people was this kind of pop culturization of this boy that Rolling Stone, you get on the cover of Rolling Stone, this is, again, you create an iconic image and nobody wanted to look at that, this boy like this. If we, it was a mugshot, and if it wasn't soft, I think it would be different. I think the aesthetics of the image and its, its softness and the, 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 his youth and his cherub face, I, it really bothered people. And, I, and part of it is that I do think people don't want to look in mirrors. And I just, I just want to agree with everybody that I think there is this, he is one of us and we just can't accept that. The audience can't accept that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I spent three days, you know, two, two or three days chasing that story around Boston, and, and I, I was there the night they caught him under the boat, and for me it was like, you know, I went out to water, what was that town they, they water found him in Waterhead, and it was, it was insane, I mean, it was, it, I never, it was something out of like a Camus novel, it was just like, it was a beautiful day, and all the, everyone, there was no one out in the streets except teams of SWAT guys, you turn a corner and they would aim at you, and you get out of your car, it was, just, it was surreal, but, then for me, in my mind, you know, after two or three days of that, and then seeing the manhunt at the night, and they brought in like the Marines, it was insane. And and then you see this photo of this kid, you know, this skinny little white kid, and and, and you know, it was just uh, hard to, to to comprehend mm -hmm. the force with this kind of perceived innocence. Uh, this photo um, was characterized by Time Lightbox. It's Tuscan mm -hmm. Hofter's uh, image. Um, and, and by the way, is she here? Yeah. Where? Oh, there you are. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and I think uh, if we can do some justice to you, I think photographers are always asking me or appreciating having more of a critical discussion about. Uh, this type of imagery, so we'll see, you know, if we can do justice to the, the photo because it really was a defining image from um, the uh, collapse of the garment factory in, in Dhaka. But the time characterizes the most powerful image to come out of that event. And then um, in the same article, uh, Shadul Alam, uh, a photographer, writer, and uh, founder of a Bangladeshi photo institute, um, wrote, this image, while deeply disturbing, is also hauntingly beautiful. An embrace in death, its tenderness rises above the rubble to touch us where we are most vulnerable. By making it personal, it refuses to let go. This is a photograph that will torment, torment us in our dreams. Quietly, it tells us never again. Uh, I have two questions for the panel, though. Um, the first one uh, has to do with the issue of beauty. To what extent does the beauty of the photo support awareness and social change? Uh, and to what extent does it create problems for the photo? Uh, then my second question is, um, some people have seen this photo as a critique of the Western lens. In other words, American media can venerate a photo like this, but one would not see a similar image uh, of American citizens uh, in a, from, uh, after a disaster like the recent uh, Waco uh, gas explosion and then or also then there is the issue of how much did we see or did we see any images at all of, uh, that were similar uh, of Americans um, from 9-11? Uh, I, 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 I personally disagree with that critique. I, I think a similar image from saying 9-11 uh, was just, I, I just don't think anyone had those images. You know, I, I was there, I covered the towers coming down and, and you know, I have the plane coming up, all that stuff, but I don't know my colleagues, I don't remember any, very few people actually, I, I know that some people had body parts, but you just didn't see it. It was a totally different kind of uh, atmosphere zone. Um, but I, I think we do see, uh, I don't know about the way of Texas, but, and, but also in, in America, uh, up until recently, we're not dealing with disasters of magnitude. I mean, how many thousands of people died in, in the DACA uh, factory? I don't know. Anyone know? I mean, it was, it was yeah, it, it was. It was just you're dealing with these kind of biblical, biblical uh, tragedies. As being shy, uh, 
I personally do not struggle with the issue of aesthetic around a picture if I feel that it's based on an honest presence on the part of the maker. I think you can photograph anything you want to under those circumstances, provided that you can justify the meaning of it. I mean, you sometimes need aesthetics to be able to walk into a story of such grueling and painful magnitude. I was quite shocked to see this when I first opened the magazine. I had been reading about the, the death count going up. I, I thought it was an enormously sensitive way to treat the disaster. Um, I'm not suggesting that there's always beauty in death, but I am suggesting that there's delicacy and a hell of a lot of painful catharsis. And if at any level, you know, that can be dignified, which it, you know, for all the tragedy in this, I think there's, there's a kind of a quiet and important beauty to saying goodbye to these people. I first saw the photograph when Taslima posted it on Facebook, because as she was shooting, she was sharing the images, and from what I, and, and maybe you can speak to this later, Taslima, but that this is part of her advocacy to try and get these images out to the world so we could see what was going on. When I first saw the images, they weren't mediated. I mean, they were her pictures and her expression, and they were not put into the American media yet. So when I saw it, I had two reactions. I mean, I, it, it to me is a very private moment, and should I really be seeing it? But at the same time, these two people and their embrace kind of defined this tragedy. Um, I, don't, I really don't have that much more to say except for that, but it, I think it was the first time that a, such a powerful news image came in front of my eyes before I saw it in legitimate news. Yeah, the, the, the discussion of aestheticizing horror is, you know, comes around and around and it's, it, it bores me to tears. Because, you know, anything which is photographic is necessarily aesthetic, and to call one, one image aesthetic as though another picture isn't. You know, anything which puts something in a frame and exposes it with you know, all the colors correct, and it's, it's an aestheticized medium. It cannot be anything other than aesthetic. We have talked earlier about um, uh, you know, how much gore is too much gore, and you know, I was saying that I, you know, I get very strongly to censorship on grounds of public taste. There's another dimension to that, which is, I do think that as professionals in our various roles as photographers, editors, publishers, that we have certain tools at our command. And surely one of the things we can achieve is if we can make people look at a picture, then we've succeeded somehow, rather than having to simply turn the page and look away. And I think that the, to make a, an image which is somehow seductive, albeit horrific, is all the more powerful for that because it does engage people with an issue which they might otherwise want to turn away from. Also, I mean, this particular tragedy is something that we, especially Western viewers, should feel intimately connected to because our um, consumer habits um, you know, enabled this to happen in a way. And so, um, you know, we are buying the clothes made by these workers. And so I, I think it's a stunning, beautiful, very powerful image. I mean, I salute you for making it and for having the presence of mind to make it and to share it and put it out there. So I mean, when I saw this image, I, I felt connected to them in a way that I need to be, right, for this not to happen again. We need to pay attention to our buying habits and corporations that do these things. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what Steve was saying. I mean, as a, as a talker, I'm sure some of you, uh, many of you probably get a situation where, you know, you you do have to put, try to try your best to put some beauty in, in, in horror. And it, but it can, it, can, it can come back to haunt you. And it can, you know, I you find yourself, uh, you know, wor worried about a, a lens, a, an aperture, a shutter speed while you're you're focusing on, on a corpse a foot away from you, someone who's a brother, a mother, a father. And here you are. And you're, you're the angle, and, and I found myself in that context a number of times, and, and then you, you know, you snap out of it for maybe a second, what the hell am I doing? 
and, but then you, but, but you want your pictures to have effect, to, to be shown. We live in such a visually sophisticated world today. Kids are growing up with video games and all sorts of, you know, films in the scene, and, and, and so, so you're competing with that. I'm, I, my photos are competing with Grand Theft Auto. They've got it, you know, and, and really, so, so they, they, you, you've got to put the beauty in it. I didn't also want to emphasize the, the word that Anita brought up, which is connection. Why? However you respond to something, you have that connection. It's a this and it, but it's something you can I mean, the, the idea that the clothes on our back were, were made by these people, I know that it, it, I have the same reaction, similar to Nina, that I, I am actually connected to, to, to this in Bangladesh, this faraway place. And um, this did politicize people a little bit after. I mean, I know that there were movements in the States to make a list of all of the companies that this factory did business with them to start boycotting them. And if a picture has that kind of power, I mean, you know, the photographers done her job. It, it may be that they were just there and they never were before when there were previous accidents, but what was interesting was in the next couple of days, there was also a lot of, these were wire photog uh, photos, so they were widely uh, accessible, of uh, garments and labels that were in the rubble. Um, so it, it, I think that visually up, up the ante, actually. Uh, well, let's go to um, uh, Spencer. Uh, we're doing this. What? We're doing this. Yeah, we're doing it. You signed on. Uh, I, I actually, I really do appreciate Spencer uh, being here and us. I, I think it's really critical to address um, this topic because it's, uh, in a way, it is sort of like, the, it has been like, a third rail of uh, you know, kind of discussion for for a while. The whole issue of how do we represent, uh, or how has the media been representing um, the blighted cities? You know, there's been a lot of discussions the past year, especially uh, as a result of the recession, about news and documentary photography, and and how do you represent blighted cities, and how do you do these depictions, and how do you do it sensitively, and um, you know, there's been a lot of debate on uh, on different uh, images and edits. And what was quite novel was uh, I sat down um, for lunch with Spencer at Look 3 last year, and he, and I think it was just sort of fresh, you know, and he said, oh, I gotta tell you about this thing that happened to me. And I, and I was like, it's such a novel story, and it actually like gives us a way to start to think about, uh, I, I think, that whole topic in a, in a, in a more constructive way. Um, and in a way, too, it's also, it's, it, it, there's like a dual, there's two vectors or two threads that run through this conversation, at least with Spencer, because it's not just about representation of the, of the blighted city, in the inner city, uh, but also it's about social media and, and interactivity and media democracy and media accountability and, and a whole like kind of game change um, that's taking place uh, right now. So um, let me just page through I have five of the images that ran at USA Today out of, I think it was about 12. And then what I'd like to do is just have um, Spencer tell you the story of his Utica shoot and, and what happened. Uh, 
poverty. You know, the numbers are, are staggering. So it's been one of, for over the, well, the last couple of years, I, when I have time, I, I, I want to go to cities and parts of the country that are just neglected. In Utica, New York, I mean, I, I don't want to offend anyone that's from Utica. It is a perfectly, you know, pretty place and beautiful, and I'm sure there is, you know, some really intact traditions there. But it's also because you don't hear it. It's one of these cities you just, that, that just kind of disappear. You know, and, and it's, 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 you know, it's not kind of a hipster colony out there. It's just, it's never discussed. So I said, you know, what the hell is going on in Utica? And I did a little bit of research. I'm like, wow, 24% of the people in Utica are living in poverty. And I told my editor, I said, yeah, I'll go. I spent two days, and and you know, the way I work, I, I use this, this, you know, this camera, and I, I, I do minimal, uh, uh, I do basic research, but I don't set up interviews or anything. I'm just roaming and looking, and and so yeah, I put out. A, I uh, did a report, I don't know, 30, 40 images, and filed it, and thought that at the end of it after two days. And then, oh, you know, Utica found out about it. Uh, and Utica was not happy, I'll tell you. Uh, and I got, a, I got a phone call first from the TV station. And how long did this take, by the way? Yeah, like four days, three days. Oh, yeah, they, 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 they were a little slow, but, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but then, so the newspaper. So, yeah, so. So the, uh, <laughs> the uh, first thing, yeah. the, the, the television station calls me. Uh, and they asked me just a quick couple questions, and I didn't do much of that. And then, the, and then the, the, the uh, TV, the, uh, the, the newspaper called me, had a very long debate, it was back and forth with women, then letters started coming in emails. And they, they, you know, to make a long story short, they, were, they thought I portrayed one angle of Utica. And, you know, there's a, and I, as I always stated, that, that's, that's a good argument, sure. And, 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 and in a sense, you are right. But the point I was making, the, she would, the editor of the newspaper was like, well, you should come back down to this other part. It's like outside the city, 20 minutes, and it's, you know, some tech hub, you know? And it's like, everything's wonderful there. And, and, and I'm like, I, 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 what I care about is core. In America, we're losing these cities, these kind of third tier cities. You know, LA and, 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 and New York are, 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 you know, doing gangbusters, you know, uh, San Francisco, but it's like, the Uticas, the Detroits, and, and even the smaller ones, the, the, the Scranton's, these places are just, you know, most of them uh, are, are just neglected and quickly being forgotten. So it was my, that was what I was aiming in, in, in visiting the Uticas, so. Did you ask her, like, specifically about the fact that 24% of the people in those Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I don't, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think it, it, it was well, you know, but then there's three quarters that are doing just well, you know. <laughs> You know, it was just kind of just back. It, it was, it was, it was going nowhere at the debate. But, but yeah, you know, and, and getting back to obviously it's not on the same level as, as the the bomber. But I I relish it. I, I I I want discussion about photos because so especially as a wire target, so often you 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 file photos, you think, wow, this is going to be you know, it's going to change things, and it's just silence, and you never see or hear about the photo again. And it, it is nice when you you get some feedback. Do you feel that? Has it changed you at all in, in terms of uh, when you're out uh, shooting stories and then you're thinking, uh, oh, I wonder what kind of feedback might come through Twitter? No, or I mean, no. I mean, I'm sure any, I mean, I, you know, the photographers in the audience have, you know, obviously have, have the same experiences. But, but being in a wire, yeah, you, your photos do go, you know, the global audience and, 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 and uh, the potential for people all walks of life and all opinions to see them is greater. But no, it's not, it's not that inhibited. There's no self censorship, but um, but yeah, no. But again, there is an argument to be made that, that we look at Detroit. I mean, that's uh, you know, I've gone out there, I've done that story, you know, and, and but the the, the argument, the counter argument is, well, it's really bad. Like Utica is just really bad, and and you know, we should. What what is our responsibility? Should are, are we propagandists for these cities to go in and try to color it? And, and, more positive way, or I think what we do is we're objective. We show reality as it really is. For me, this was good I I think that another thing that probably happened for Spencer in this body of work is that we now have the comment sections, and for all of our years coming up as editors and image makers, I I think we worked in a little bit of a vacuum. I mean, there was a, 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 an aspect of you do this large photo essay and maybe only 10 of your images get seen. But now the accessibility to Spencer's whole body of work, it's just up for grabs. And it becomes this chaotic comment mess because, again, people don't want to see what's really in front of them. 
So you get the call from the people in the city and they say, come see out the pretty part of our city. Well, but, but that's not what I as a journalist want to look at and I don't think that's the story. Before we used to be able to make that decision and, and, and kind of feel okay about it, could still feel okay about it, but you have to navigate these, the, the comments from the audience. I think it's a good thing and a bad thing. And I don't know, I don't know if you want to speak but, to that. No, but, I know. I mean, I uh, I do stories on wealth all the time too, and on, I go to wealthy neighborhoods and wealthy parts of the city, and, and there's never any negative feedback. But maybe just the wealthy people aren't looking at the photo. But I don't know. Do you feel it would be a more thorough story if you had engaged certain sure. parts? Um, ideally, yeah, and it, ideally you could spend a month up there, and, and you can do a very wide picture. But but I mean, let's not we can't get past the the reality that 24 percent of living in this rather small city live in poverty. And that's not, you know, lower middle class. That's that's make uh, that's family four under twenty three thousand. That's that's poor. Well, also what kind of stories about wealth are you doing in there trained wealthy people positive life? Oh, well, only positive, only positive. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean I, I that's I don't know. I mean I mean I, I do four days a week I'm I'm on the floor of the Say the word stock exchange. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean that's wealth. That's that's a story. I mean, who consumes those images? People. I, th I think it's um, you know you talk about the comments pages, but I think it's actually richer and deeper than that. In that we're moving out of an age when journalism took the form of me telling you what's happening in the world. It is now becoming uh, an absolutely collaborative process of how we tell each other what's happening in the world. And I think it's fantastic, and I think it's absolutely wonderful and that, that uh, Spencer and the people you work with put out a story, catalyzes the discussion, and the, every single person in Utica has a means of uh, coming back and telling a different story. I think it's fantastic, it's enriching, and I think it's part of the mindset of having this discussion is that we feel a little bit affronted that people should have this right uh, or this ability, but actually it's fantastic. Uh, so the, 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 what happens to me is it's actually a story of an enriched media environment. So they still may give you the key to the city. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, a tarred feather, more like it. I haven't been back. <laughs> uh, let's move on to, uh, and I'm, I'm really excited about this, uh, in that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this form, this format, is becoming so ubiquitous, but it's not anything that people have really talked about or processed in terms of how it works, uh, what the strengths and weaknesses of it are, and so what I did, uh, and, uh, and where, I, where I went uh, is right to the state of the art. I think that uh, not only is um, what the work that Tom Lightbox uh, is doing every day extraordinarily impressive, but what they're doing on Friday, uh, and most of the time I believe it's Phil Bicker who's doing these edits, is doing these um, pictures of the week galleries. A lot of people are doing photo galleries, daily photo galleries, uh, eclectic mix of, of, of images. Uh, Lens does one, Michelle McNally does one every day, um, but this one uh, is one that I, I always look at. And so what I want to try and do, without showing you um, all 34 images from the week of uh, August 16th to August 23rd, is I pulled out um, some images in three different groups. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, a group of seven images. They're all, they all appear consecutively by the way, so the image you're going to see are one, that ran one after another as you're clicking through. I'm going to show you a group of seven, then a group of two, and then a group of three. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, come back and ask the panelists a series of questions uh, about what we just saw. So here's the first group. Um, this is number 17, uh, a pelican in a Belgian zoo. Then the next one, shot by uh, Andrew Burton, I believe he's here for Getty, uh, is a boy sits on his front steps in Camden, New Jersey, another blighted city um, subject matter. And then I'm, I'm going to read you the um, caption for this next photo. Uh, it reads, a workman wraps a statue of Benjamin Franklin in protective cover in preparation for upcoming construction at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. Now, here's the next image in sequence. Bodies of people activists say were killed by nerve gas in the Ghouta region are seen in the Duma neighborhood of Damascus. Okay, 
click to the next photo. Number 21, a warbler caught in a net in England. Next photo, an Egyptian worker built a scaffold at the Rabah al Adwiya Mosque in Nasser City, Cairo, which if you're clicking through quickly, you might not uh, realize that that was the site um, the week before, I believe, or very recently before, of the battle between Russian police, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Egyptian police and the Muslim Brotherhood, where 500 people died and 3,700 people were injured. Uh, then the very next picture, I think it's the last one in that group of seven, is um, a street musician in a market in Cairo frequented by terrorists. So that's, that's that group. And I'm going to show you two more from further into the edit. Uh, this is number 28, and the, and, uh, the caption reads, a government employee from Kashmir attacked by a police water cannon during a protest in India. Then the next image, Baltimore Ravens cheer squad. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, the next three actually appeared earlier in the, um, in the edit, but I thought it, in terms of presenting and talking about it, it was better to show it at the end. So the next photo is number, number five, that Indonesian soldiers celebrate Independence Day. The next photo, I'll read you the caption, pretty much complete. Uh, Adan Sheikh Abdi Sheikh, who has been sentenced to death for the murder of journalist Hassan Yusuf Absuj, stands high to a pole before he is executed by shooting at close range in a public square, and they named the square, uh, in the Somali capital Mogadishu. And then the next photo, number seven, uh, a warrior obstacle race in Indiana. Actually, I'm Maybe I should go back a little more slowly, sorry. We just run it backwards. Which allows me to get back to my questions. Um, what is time? And I really want to be constructive about this because I'm really interested in this format. And, and again, like I said, I don't think people really are thinking about this format or talking about this format, but it's very, it's becoming very, very common. Questions are, what is time achieving with the sequence of pictures from Ben Franklin through the Warbler? What meaning is it intended to achieve? What function is it supposed to serve? Next question, what is happening between the water cannon shot and the cheer squad? How much does the artistry of the photo and the purple color water down the photo as a protest image? Also, what is the idea behind pairing it with the cheer squad? Finally, what is the effect of pairing that execution photo with the cannon explosion and the big splash from the obstacle race? And what is it the, and, uh, and what is the effect of the embedding of this single execution photo uh, or the corpse, Syrian corpse photo within the other 34? These questions are specific to imagery, oh, I'm sorry, that, that leads me to my main question, sorry, which is, is there a benefit uh, of the new slideshow that we're not appreciating? For example, is it possible it's communicating information and meaning to us in a new and emotional visual language more like music or dance? Or is it more problematic than that, forsaking context and sensitivity in the name of aesthetics and infotainment? I find it utterly schizophrenic. And I think it's very much about infotainment and you know, the merits to all the pictures in there. I can well see the editors asking for things that are both lighter and funnier to, to engineer reaction from this vast array of people who tap into the Time website. But I think it fails to, to reach any kind of depth at all. I think the space that they use there, and I think to some extent they do, should, should be devoted more to an essay form. You know, if you're going to explore the cheerleaders, explore it with one, more than one picture. I find those juxtapositions extremely 
um, disoriented. To a large extent, I say that because I, I did that gig at Newsweek for a while, and the editor's disposition and aesthetic on judging what should follow what was best described as appalling. It was shocking. They wanted to force things into boxes to appeal to yet another aspect of the audience. And the words that they used tended to linger on lightness and beauty and humor at the expense of something uh, really quite dreadful like the execution picture. They felt almost forced to put that in there. But you know, I'd, I'd have to talk to the people at the time to ask them what the hell they were thinking in that run of pictures. But it, at least for me, and everything is very subjective visually, I, I find it confusing. And, and uh, I, I don't go back to ever look at it. It's just too all over the place. But that's my position. Jamie, I, 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 I could, uh, sorry, disagree with you more. Um, uh, I think, uh, I, I, I don't know. First of all, I think you're insinuating that maybe the great thought went into the picture. I, I, would, I, I don't know. It could have been like a night editor could say. But as a wire photographer, again, uh, I, I, I strongly feel that, that you should be able to, a, a great photo just need support. It should be able to, you know, not all these are, are amazing photos, but, but a lot of them are just very, very strong images. And I, and I always, I love a photo that I can look at and it can just, you know, kind of twist or play with my interp conventional interpretation of, of, a, of a news event. These slideshows, I just think, are very, I think you made the point that people just blast through them. So they have to move very symphonically. And, and Michael made this point, that they are like little pieces of music, and I've always looked at them that way. I don't try and describe a lot of the but no, it's a, it, Sorry, it's a, that, that analogy is right. It's a piece of music, so you're making an album. I, you know, it is very subjective to look at pictures, and Wire provides actually some of the most astoundingly wonderful pictures. I just, reacting to that edit, mm -hmm. didn't think it was a particularly good album. I'm not suggesting that everything has to be a single topic. Mm -hmm. But juxtaposition is extremely important in sensitivity, and I just didn't think it was a very good album. So I'm saying song or song. The generation that whoever, you know, probably the generation that put the slideshow together, they don't listen to albums anymore. I still buy albums, I love albums, but I'm sure the person who put the slideshow together has an iPod where he or she has, has nicked songs from 20, 30 different albums and taken them out of context. And personally, you know, I can't listen to music that way. An album, you know, the sequence is the reason the song starts and ends. And I think the younger generation has passed it. They just don't get it. They don't have the time for it. They don't care about it. It's a tricky one. It's a tricky subject because uh, talking to some of my friends at time, uh, and they mentioned, and I don't know if Phil Bicker actually did this edit or not. Um, so one of my friends told me that he was on vacation for two weeks through the stretch, and uh, he's not named as the uh, uh, on this particular uh, uh, edit, but uh, he lays out the images um, on the floor and spends you know hours upon hours upon hours. And I do think that to be, uh, we can talk about the moral uh, aspect of it, but if we just talk for a second, if you can, about the artistic or the craft aspect of it, I really do think that you know that. He and a lot of, and there's others out there, the Charlotte Observer editor does, has these kind of quote unquote eloquent edits where in, in this one, and why I chose some of these groupings is because the whole thing of wrapping and the fabric and then you know where it goes to the scrim in Egypt, you know, I think he's really thinking about that as kind of visual choreography. So um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's an integrity to that, you know, to, 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 the, to that particular approach. Um, maybe we should jump to uh, this image, which, if I show of hands, how many people have seen this before? Oh, fabulous, okay, great. Uh, this is, that, that's hard to do, by the way. Um, this is an ad from Crisis Relief Singapore, uh, and there was, so I think, six different versions, um, and this is, it's called um, Liking Isn't Helping. The idea here is that Facebook likes don't in themselves help people. Uh, so I have a few questions. Uh, my main question though is, is this just a critique of Facebook 
Or is it also a little more complicated than that? Is it also a critique of this type of compassion photography also? <laughs> or just what do you think, just digesting this thing right off the bat, because I've thought about it for a couple of hours and never saw it before. Well, while my colleagues are thinking about that, the first thing that struck me is that why are all of the hands male? The 
there's um, uh, there's actually turns out quite a lot to say about this picture. Um, I think it's absolutely key here is you know why do we engage with pictures and why do we engage with information and news at all? And the most profound understanding which I've, I've come across was uh, a character called Jake Levine, who's the managing director at Dig.com. Uh, I was listening to him talk last year, and they've done a lot of research into who looks at news and why. And Dig is this uh, function where, where headlines are created by users, and the more votes it gets, the higher up the page it goes. And they spend a lot of time researching, so why do people look at information, why do they read news? And people come back with answers like, well, I want to know what's happening, I want to be informed, I want to help, I want to and they would ask why. And every time they would ask why, they would go a little deeper and said, all, all came back to one answer, which is people, we position ourselves in our social grouping by the information we consume. And I thought that was really amazing. And I've interrogated that thought a lot over the last year. And I have to say, I can't gainsay it. I think it's absolutely a fantastic insight. Why does anyone consume news and information? Very rarely is it because we're actually going to do something. Most often, it's so we can we will fit in the social group we want to fit with. Why do I read about what's happening in, in Darfur? It's because I want I want to be informed so when I meet my friends, etc., etc. Um, and I thought that was a profound, profound statement because the actual times when I or anyone in this room have actually lifted a finger and done something in response to a photograph, however it's shocking and appalling, I would guess it's pretty small. It's happened. I've done it. I know many people in this room who have done it, but how often? And what is our function in consuming news? And I, I, I think that's really a, a, something to, to model. Well, one thing I'm going to say about this picture is I brood over it, is I think the execution of it um, is, is bizarrely as backwards. And the reason I think that is if you look at pictures of the I just remember seeing a series years ago, the Portuguese leaving Angola and Mozambique in the 70s, where you would have soldiers actually holding severed heads and sort of, and that outraged sensibility kind of showing their trophies. This picture very much feels as though the victims are being lauded over. I mean, I, I'm just referencing the visuals that, that have impacted me in the past, but. I think it, it, it utterly backfires, but I'd be curious to know, did, did they raise consciousness and make money? But are they suggesting that it's good that these people are damaged? It kind of reads that way to me. It certainly does. It is very aggressive, actually. When looking at it a little further, it's not like it's so slick and that it serves the purpose of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, the agency, but it's that, you know, Right, it actually is a little more, a little twisted. Very twisted. Um, we could talk about uh, the Arnie Svensson shot, but I, I, I'm sort of, well, we could actually take a vote. I'm also kind of interested in just opening up the conversation to uh, the audience with questions and comments. Um, how many people want to talk about Arnie? Okay, let's go right to some questions and comments then. We did hear a little while. Yes. Um, I have um, a question for Spencer and a question and a related question for Jamie, but um, it was prompted actually by something you said, Stephen, about how everyone has access now to comments and everyone can critique news stories and and kind of tell their own story. And I actually very much disagree with that because I think that, for example, there's a terrible digital divide in this country and around the world. I think computers are a luxury item that not everyone has. I, um, going to the public library, I see loads of people who are there as their only internet access, but frankly, they're there to the job hunt. They're not there to comment on stories. So with that in mind, I, I, I wondered, Spencer, if you could just provide a little more context about your Utica story. I, I'm curious how the paper actually ran it. You're not from Utica. <laughs> You're not from Utica. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> okay, okay. But I am curious about those folks and what they might have thought you were up, you know, when they agreed to be photographed. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I have a two part question to you. Oh, okay, sorry. But no, the, so the other one, I mean, so just so I don't get ignored, because that's a big question. But um, so thinking about, though, I mean, Jamie's story about his editor saying, you got to get me pictures are really, I mean, that is the class.
classic kind of top-down, distant office guy in a suit, this, or woman in a suit, this not, probably me, deciding what the story was. And I just wondered if, you know, if a person in Iraq did have, kind of to Stephen's point, more access to say, this is what we're seeing, would that have been changed? Or is it simply a matter of trusting the photojournalists who are actually on the ground being journalists? Would that have changed that dialogue back in the office? So, okay, now Spencer, sorry. Oh, uh,
in our community, in our photo community, we see much more complex bodies of work that people have been doing for years. And, and this work is not necessarily finding a place in print, but it's online. And I guess I don't have a real point to make except for to say that I know that I get very critical when I see you know, what we call parachuting in stories. But then I hear Spencer talk and I realize the challenges that you have to face with time and access and that you're going in saying, I, I want to cover this aspect of this community. And you have to stay super focused. And so I just want to recognize these two things that are, are happening amongst in our community where these these men and women, these photographers, want to cover these stories so badly. And, and I mean this in the most positive way, but the challenges are, are overwhelming. And I, I have admiration for both sides, but I, I guess I just wish that we were seeing more of these larger bodies of work, that there was a real place for that. Um, and our appetite for easy, accessible news stories from these cities. I grew up in Detroit, and I won't talk about my opinions about pictures from Detroit, but it's a good example of what's happened is this challenge of trying to cover these places that we live. Just quickly, uh, right right here in, in, in Brooklyn, you see this. I mean, I mean, Brooklyn is an incredibly, uh, maybe even overcovered story right now. You can pick up any, any French paper, any German paper, there's going to be stories about Brooklyn. You want to buy it, it's beautiful people. And, I, I, and I'm guilty because I, I do that a lot too. I shoot a lot of positive, great stories about Brooklyn. I mean, this, this area right out here is amazing. But that said, I also, my, again, my, my editors let me cover, I cover a fair amount of the crime and, and the murders that happen in Brooklyn. And, and I'm always amazed. I, I live in Brooklyn and there's areas in Brooklyn that are just, they couldn't be starker. I mean, they, they look, some of them look like, remind me of like Port Prince, the poverty, violence, it is so in your face and graphic intense, and I rarely read about it. And, and when I go to these stories, I, maybe there's like uh, that local New York one, I'll see them, and, uh, and, and, and that's about it, you know, it's just, these stories aren't covered. Well, you read about hipster Brooklyn, right? Hipster because Brooklyn, that's yeah. where the commerce is, and I think that that goes back to the point of, you know, the New York Times, what they've done, maybe 10 stories this year on Brooklyn and how awesome it is, well, that's, it, it's this much in Brooklyn, right? Massive borough, and I, and I just I agree with you, Spencer. I think that those other stories aren't being covered, but they're not only not being covered in New York, they're not being covered in Chicago, Detroit. Yes. Let's uh, take two more questions. I'm going to squeeze it early, but um, I think it's very crucial to, to point out all the issues of the current and current market, but what's holding us back to finding solutions? What's your question? What's holding us back to finding solutions to these issues that we have? Is there any other possible alternative model that we can follow or explore? Uh, in terms of the documentation of why the cities, or are you talking about? No, I'm talking in general about the editorial market. There seems to have a lot of magical financial issues. So we've been playing out so far through personalization and the lack of funds for photographers. So is there any attempt to explore alternative markets or models that can actually uh, find a way around these issues? I guess I hope so. Well, we, I'll, I'll say this, I mean, all of us are, I mean, Nina and, and Spencer are photographers, so I, I might not include this. We're all formerly affiliated. We, I, I mean, I don't want to really speak for Jamie and Stephen, but I think that we've all had to reformulate our careers as editors and photographers. And I think that the way to change, it's a, unfortunately, it's a long road we're on, that we've all been living through, but we all have to reinvent ourselves to be able to kind of have the confidence and the ability to be open-minded to find our way down this, this road. It's challenging. And I guess I just, you know, we're all sitting up here and I, I really feel like I need to make that point that we've all rejected our careers. Uh, I can't tell you exactly how I did that or how these guys did, but we're in different models now, and the change is going to come from all of us in our community and being open-minded and, and kind of open to these changes. We're dead if we're, if we're not. Um, 
it, it's, it's fascinated me for many years that our, our understanding of how news and information works is fundamentally commercially driven. And it's been commercially driven by the structure of publishing uh, and uh, more importantly by the, the form of advertising that's funded publishing. Um, but you know, the, 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 the existence of the photo story, uh, you know, it came basically, it was done by Berlin Illustrated in you know, 1932, but essentially it was the invention of color gravure which made you know, printing of large expanses of paper with imagery possible uh, and then became you know, a vehicle for advertising. Okay? You know, our, the way news has been structured and fed to us has been a commercial process for the last hundred years. And it's not a God-given format. It's a, uh, it's a, um, a mammon given format. And um, what I find so exciting by the moment is there's now a chance for reinvention. Now, you know, the internet is far from commerce free. And it is very much, I think it was Lessig, you know, who, who very pressingly, way back in 2003, said that you know, the internet offers us an opportunity for extraordinary freedom or an incredible prison. And you know, as corporations and governments get more and more control of the internet, you know, we, we're all very aware of what, you know, how that works. It's not all free, but there are opportunities to reinvent and to reimagine our relationship with information in a way that was never possible before. And sure, we all need to make a living, but uh, there's a bigger question out there. I think it's phenomenal in terms of freedom. I think it's a prison financially because the monetization of the web has essentially been, I mean, for, for some elements, yeah, but for photography, it's so seriously been undervalued. Or how do you approach photography online with value? It's too much that's free out there. I think that's the Yes. I'm sorry. Hi. so busy with uh, working with uh, family members of victims I, and I couldn't get time to upload this and maybe after three or four days I just get some time to upload it and one of my friends said why you uploaded this on Facebook it is uh, it, it cannot make comfort and it's not good for me and it's not positive things you don't need to show these kinds of picture and I replied him that I think I have to show this because uh, it, it is also not a, a good experience for me. It's also a very painful experience for me and our owners, our government and uh, the international brands, retailers, they think that garment workers like a machine or like a product, they can make only profit. So I think through this pain, maybe uh, we can feel that they are also human beings. So I think that I have to share it with consumers, with readers of uh, photographers that uh, maybe help our uh, garment workers uh, to make awareness because I don't think it's a national issue because the consumer of our product that made by our worker, Bangladeshi garment workers, most of West and European consumers, so they have to know what's going on. That's why I think I have to show it and I have to share this pain to all. That's all. Thank you.